midnight in a 200-year-old haunted house down a dark Sussex road comes a carload of Brighton men with the eeriest job in the world. For the Sussex ghost hunters are preparing to track down whatever it is that has frightened away from here three different caretakers. They bring to their unenviable task some of the resources of modern science, including radar and a tape recorder, plus, of course, plain common sense. As a precaution against practical jokers, Mr. Ted Henty, the chief ghost hunter, seals the windows. An ex-Brighton policeman and ex-soldier, he's an expert at devising booby traps for unwelcome earthly visitors. Sometimes ghost hunter Henty strews sand and flour over the spot where the supernatural disturbances are claimed to have occurred. And Mr. Bruce Copen uses a device, which he calls a radiomagnetic detector pendulum, to find out whether the ghost had been a man or a woman, and where the spooky goings-on took place. He's a dowser, and claims that with this divining rod, he can tell the age of the troublemakers when they died. Mr. Louis Hastier, a wireless and electrical engineer, brings to the hunt instruments that check up on human trespassers. Radar, which can immediately detect a human presence, is one of his exposure weapons. The hunters know that the disturbances that frightened away the three caretakers, no one else had lived here for 20 years, were near the chimney. So a thorough search is made for a possible simple explanation to the mystery, or who knows, the ghost himself. Cotton thread provides an effective check on whether the uninvited guest is a genuine spook or a real live fake. A ghost who is using his title under false pretenses will, if he stumbles into this trap, soon be brought back to reality. The sound of thread snapping or an ornament falling will be amplified by a microphone, establishing the movements of any phony ghost. And now for some real atmosphere. The caretakers had all told a similar story about the mysterious happenings here. They told of paint pots and ornaments being moved. They told of creaking floorboards, shuffling feet. Could all three have been merely imagining things? Could the weird surroundings have played tricks with our minds? At the tape recorder, Mr. Dudley Gamble Jones, the team's inventive brain, awaits the telltale sound that will give them the answers. They've even installed their own internal telephone system so that any disturbances recorded on the various instruments can be reported to each other immediately. <laughs> The spook seems to be a bit shy just now, but the ghost hunters are convinced there is trouble somewhere around, and they intend to go on investigating until they are satisfied that the supposed ghost has no further interest in his present surroundings. You wouldn't think there was anything sinister about this pub, but when Mrs. Campbell Wilson and her husband took it a few weeks ago, they soon discovered that the cheery atmosphere of the bar wasn't the whole story. There may not have been anything to worry the customers, but Alec Wilson was soon convinced the place was haunted. They'd both lost so much sleep that Mrs. Wilson often dozed at the bar. She came to dread closing time, fearing what the ghost had in store that night. The Campbell Wilsons had heard the local legend that the pub was haunted, but at first didn't believe it. Any churchyard looks ghostly at dead of night. This one seems to have ghostliness all its own. Perhaps because in the reign of Henry VII, some Amersham Protestants were burned at the stake, the way with heretics in those days, and there's been a spooky atmosphere ever since.
three of the martyrs were imprisoned at the inn the night before they were burned. The story goes that their spirits haven't let the old place forget it. So, after a few nights at the checkers, nobody scoffs at ghosts anymore. men turn pale, the ghost turns on the ale. The Wilsons called in a well-known medium, Molly Moncrief, to see if she could exorcise the unwanted spirits. Apparently the average ghost is quite reasonable once you take the trouble to understand its point of view. Well, I looked downstairs, Mr. Wilson, and I discovered that your ghost was not one of the martyrs, it was the jailer. He had the keys. He gives me the impression of a monk. He wears a long robe and a hood. Now, I'll try to get in touch for you. Molly tried going into a trance to have a word with the ghost. Your name is Auden. Put your keys on the table. Go on, put them on the table. You don't need those anymore. Time's gone by, hundreds of years. Your job's done. That's it. Go away now. Go on, you're a spirit now. Go away. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's all right now, Mr. Wilson. I don't think you'll be bothered anymore. It's gone. What a blessing to know that the only spirits left will be in bottles. Yeah, 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 yeah. This house is Pilgrim's Cottage, Wilbarston. It is haunted. That at least is the claim of Mrs. Mabel Cullen, who asks the Reverend John Ashplant, a Methodist minister from nearby Corby, to help deal with the unearthly visitation. The minister leaves after giving what help he can. Tackling the ghost from another angle is spiritualist medium Michael Hearn. He believes the house was once used for black magic and in the cellar directs digging operations in search of evidence. Meanwhile at the front door, our interviewer Bill Simon calls to ask Mrs. Cullen about the ghost, an inoffensive one whom she and her daughters call George. Mrs. Cullen, are you sure you saw a ghost? Yes, I feel quite sure that I did. Could you describe him? Yes. It was a uh, part of the man encircling my bedroom. It just consisted of the head and the shoulders, and it tapered off from that to uh, from, the, from the waist down. Could you tell what sort of clothes he was wearing? I feel sure he was dressed in black. Had you seen anything before you saw the ghost? No, I never had, except I had seen darting light. But I had the same feeling of entombment that I had again when I saw the ghost on the next night. Have you ever had that sort of feeling before you came no, here? No, I've never had it before. It's an entirely new sensation. In the main bedroom of the 17th century cottage, George first appeared. Since then, Mrs. Cullen, the only one to see him so far, has refused to sleep in it. The villagers say he's angry at being disturbed by the digging up of tombstones a few yards away and is trying to find a new resting place. This seems a good moment for medium Michael Hearn to put himself in a trance and consult his Chinese spirit guide, Li Wong. Do not worry, I can show you power of God that all will now be well, and that peace, love, and harmony will reign in this house. Do you understand, my child? Thank you. Mrs. Cullen, is your mind any more at ease now? Yes, I feel that this problem has more or less been cleared up now. I hope I should be happier here. And do you think you'll ever sleep in that room? Yes, I do intend to. 
So now all is well, George is no longer earthbound, and peace will reign at Wilbaston. <laughs> That's what they think. <laughs>